It's not even a little late. It was funny. It's like I looked at my clock and it was like five after. I literally took a sip of coffee, looked, and it was like 18 after. So I don't know how that happened. Uh, I, I must have just been deep in thought or, or something. All right. Okay. Um, we, we sort of have one ingredient missing in our, uh, in our um, introduction to ASP.NET. We've talked about... We've talked about the fact that there are ASP.NET controls. And these controls provide a framework. And when you think of a framework, you think of something to build upon. All right? Um, so it gives you a head start in building your web application. Because a lot of the basic things that many web applications require, there's a component for it. So you don't have to build everything from scratch. It's like, and again, my history is fuzzy on this, but like the whole notion of like interchangeable parts and the assembly line and all that where you didn't have a craftsman craft every wheel by hand and assemble a cart. They, they had all these parts and they put them together or something like that. I, I don't know. You learn about that in history class. I'm amazed that I still remember, remember uh, all that stuff. But at any rate, um, the idea is similar that if you have these components, you can put them together, and it's good from a number of perspectives. It's good because you don't have to worry, you don't have to fuss about the like real low-level details of something. You can think sort of on a higher level. You can think of your user's requirements and think about coding the stuff that's tricky and the stuff that's unique to your application. You don't have to worry about like little like basic sort of functionality like validating to make sure someone puts a number in a text box, for example. All right. Not that you can't write that code. If you've taken C Sharp before, you've probably written that code. It's not that hard, but it's like washing the dishes, right? Washing the dishes isn't that hard, but I would be eternally grateful if someone were to do it for me, right? So that I could worry about other things, things that only I can worry about. All right. So, Again, in, in, in terms of that, that's one thing that the ASP.NET controls provide is components. And these components, remember, live on the server. All right? We talked a lot about the client-server interaction, how the client requests a page from the server. The server does its thing and sends back a web page. Remember that when it gets back to the client, it's a web page. It is HTML, CSS, JavaScript. It's the things that web browsers understand. Those ASP.NET components live on the server. The server has to process them in order to get a completed web page. If you try to open up one of those components in a web browser, like if you try to open up an ASPX, page in a web browser, it wouldn't work because you're not opening up a web page, you're opening up instructions or a recipe for a web page. So we did that uh, example last time with the calendar control where I put a calendar control on the page, ran through the server, took one little line, one little calendar control, and it generated a whole bunch of stuff. It generated an HTML table. It generated some scripting that allowed us to switch between months, et cetera, et cetera. We then looked to see how to hook our CSS to that, how to hook our CSS code to that, all right, which is important. Um, the key in my mind to remembering how to or, or, or to knowing how to style something in ASP.NET is to keep in mind the HTML that gets generated. Remember, you always have several hooks that you can attach a style to. You can attach a, a style to a, an HTML tag. You can attach a style to uh, a, 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 an ID. And you can attach a style to a class. So you have those three hooks, and you have like a million different combinations of those that you can do it. So you can do it within an ID, a particular tag. So all your links within your navigation section, you make look a certain way and so on. All right, so what is the missing ingredient? What are we going to look at today? What we're going to look at today is code um, that manipulates the components. All right? One thing that we did not do with the calendar last time is 
I just dragged the calendar over and I just set the def I just kept the defaults. I didn't go and manipulate any of the properties. Well, every ASP.NET component has a whole set of properties that you can manipulate, that you can customize. All right, and you can customize them within Visual Studio to sort of give them an initial value, but you can also then go and manipulate those attributes via code. And let me give you an example. How many of you have seen, and again, this is almost a ridiculous question to ask, how many of you have seen Star Wars? Will it be a spoiler for me to tell you who Luke Skywalker's father is? Okay. <laughs> if, if it is, please leave the room for a, a few minutes. And, yeah, and then, then we'll come back. All right, so let's say I'm going to make a web page that has a spoiler on it, right? And the way it's going to work is I'm going to show information about this. You can imagine this being like IMDB's page or whatever. And then we have a button that says show spoiler, you know. And that way, if you didn't want to see the spoiler, you wouldn't press the button. And if you did want to see the spoiler, you could press it and see that. Well, that's sort of dynamic, right? We have to, we're going to have something that's invisible, and then we're going to make it visible based on the user doing something. So we're going to have stuff on the page, ASP.NET controls on the page, and we're going to set their properties, but then we're going to go and manipulate those properties via code. And that will sort of give us the full circle, all right? After I show you that, we're done for the semester. All right, we'll, we won't tell anyone. We'll just take a break, you know, every Thursday, do whatever you want. No, I'm just joking. Um, after that, we've covered all the concepts. Of course, as they say, the devil is in the details, right? All the, learning about all the different ASP.NET controls and, and becoming better at programming and manipulating them is going to be our work for the rest of the semester. But after we finish this example, we've, we've seen an overview of most of the stuff that we can do. There's just going to be more of it and more details. So let me go in and let me create a new .NET application. I like to do this a few times, create a new one from scratch. That way everyone sees the process that I go through in creating it. Someone wants to get the lights. Probably be a good idea. One of my greatest accomplishments as a teacher is one time I had someone outside in the hall close the door because I was talking too loud. Because <laughs> it usually goes the other way, right? Usually yeah. people outside are, are making noise and, and, you know, it's tough to concentrate. So, like, Usually I'll close the door. Well, that time I was disrupting their conversation with, here I am thinking I'm doing everyone a favor, right? Providing education for free, even for the people just walking by, you know? And, and that's the thanks I get. All right, so I will go to Visual Studio. I've heard of such people in the world, but I've never actually really met one. <laughs> so I'm opening up Visual Studio. I'm going to take a quick nap. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Problem is, is every time, you know, these machines are like the ones in lab, they, they have that deep freeze on them, so every time you're rebooting, you're rebooting fresh, so some of the things that happen the first time you run have to run, every, you know, every time. I think that's the problem. All right. So, I'm going to go up to File, New, Website. Now, you may do this differently in your C-sharp classes, all right, and that, that's fine. And there, there's probably a bunch of ways that you can do it, but this is the way that seems to me to be the most straightforward. New website. I click New. I can then put it anywhere 
where I want to. The things to remember are that we want the, the template to be visual C sharp, all right, which appears to be the default. Um, we're going to work with the .NET Framework 4.5. And at least most of the time, we're going to pick ASP.NET Empty Website. One of these days when I'm feeling crazy, I might pick up something else. But we're going to most of the time start with uh, an empty website so that we can build all the stuff ourselves. All right. I find where to put it. So I can browse, and I'm going to put it on the desktop, and I'm going to give the folder a name. I click open. It tells me it doesn't exist. Do I want to create it? Sure. I then click OK, and it makes the project folder, the website folder, and it creates two files in that folder. All right, It creates a web config file and a web debug config, config file. We'll look at these more later on in this uh, semester. Um, I mean, as the name uh, implies, they, they provide parameters you know, that the web application uses um, in doing its job. All right. One of the main things we're going to put in there, for example, will be the database connection. All right? uh, to connect to a database, you need a database connection string. All right? Well, if you think about it, if I have 50 pages, do I want that database connection string to live on all 50 pages? Of course not. I want to put it in one place and have everything reference that one place. Well, guess what? That's the role of the web configuration file, a place for you to put stuff in that every page on your site can reference configuration-wise. All right, so I now have a folder called Star Wars, and if I look in it, I have the web config file and the web debug config file. Um, I'm going to close out of this, believe it or not. And I'm going to put it in another folder. And the reason I do this is if you, when you get into like zipping and unzipping and moving files back and forth, sometimes they get like embedded inside another folder. I run into that a lot. Or students will like download something. Again, I'm not really sure how Canvas would, would handle this, but sometimes with Angel, students would download <coughs> stuff that they had uploaded, and they get like one of these like extra folders. All right. Let me show, uh, again, to open this up, I would again go to Visual Studio. File, open, website. And I would navigate to that folder. Another folder. But I don't want to open that. Why don't I want to open that? Because that's not the folder that contains the web config file. I want to drill down to the folder that contains the web config file. And in this case, that's the Star Wars folder. All right, so it's important to do that. If you don't do that, then it's going to get confused because it won't be able to find the web config file and it won't be able to run and bad things will happen. So if you have code that ran and you try opening it up and it doesn't run anymore, one thing to look is make sure you open up the right folder and you don't have like stuff inside of folders, inside of folders, and so on. All right, so I open it up and I'm back in business. All right, so let's go make a page. File new. File. I'm going to pick a web form. A web form is an ASPX file. 
Interestingly enough, it wants to do this in Visual Basic. I'm not really sure why. I'm going to change that to C Sharp. Go here. I'm going to place code in separate file. All right, so we'll do that. And you should have at least one page, at least one page. You could only have one page. You should have a page in your app called default.aspx, which is by default your application's home page. Now I know for like the first few examples, there's only like one page in your app, so that's pretty simple. But um, as we go forward, as we have multiple page things, default.aspx should be the page that I want to open to when I go in to grade your stuff. All right, place code in a separate file. I definitely want that. I will click Add. And now I will get created two files. ASPX and default ASPX CS. This being the code behind. This being where I put the code to manipulate stuff in. This being the GUI. All right. We can view this GUI a few different ways. All right, we can simply use it and, and view the text. We can do a design view where we have a graphical view, and we have a split view where you can see both. Doesn't really matter to me how you do that, provided that you write good code. All right. My caution is that if you use a GUI mode and get used to dragging stuff around, um, your coding skills sort of, um, you know, um, aren't getting exercised. All right. So if you drag stuff around, it may do things following sort of the path of least resistance, and it might not really code things in a good way. So again, you know, I use the GUI sometimes too, but it's good to know the code as well. Even if you use the GUI, and even if you're successful at it, and you avoid all the, the traps um, that are associated with it of, you know, you don't over rely on it and so on, you should be familiar with the code. There's sometimes that you could stare at the GUI for hours and not figuring out how to do something, but if you're familiar with the code, you can look right into it and say, oh, I need to change that. All right. Remember, a GUI's job is to hide stuff from you. Right? Hide some of the details and, and, and control the way that you interact with certain things all right, to make it easier for you. Well, if you really understand something on a nuts and bolts level, that sometimes can get in your way. right? And it's much better just to be able to look at the code. All right. Let's go in here and I'm going to pin the toolbar here. actually going to go into design mode. I'm going to put a label. I'm going to put a button. And I'm going to put another label. And I can double click that. Oops takes me to it. I can go in here and put the text for the label. Down here again is the properties of that. And the text for the label is the properties that it's going to show. So I'm going to say Luke Skywalker fights Darth Vader. And it shows me that. Then in my second label, I'm going to put the spoiler. Darth Vader is Luke's dad. Alright. So. And I'm going to change this button to say show spoiler. All right. Now a few things. By default it gave these things certain names. Like it called that label one. It called that button one. 
and it called this label <coughs> 2. Now, ideally, you are going to give these meaningful names. You don't want to be like sitting in uh, trying to code, trying to remember if the name field is in text box 1 or text box 48 or something like that. It's good if you give these meaningful names. It's good if you follow some sort of um, naming convention as well. For example, start every label with the word label or even LBL. All right? It almost doesn't matter what naming convention you use as long as you're consistent with it. Um, again, consistency is a good thing as far as programming goes. That's one of the benefits of using these ASP.NET controls, is they, they handle things in a consistent manner. All right? Now, the purest viewpoint would say, yeah, give each of these unique names. Or, or not unique names, but, but uh, descriptive names. The practical part of me says, there's really only one I'm really concerned with getting the right name on. Which one of these things do you think I'm really concerned about getting the right name on? The spoiler. And why is that? Because we're going to do something with that. Right? If it's just something that's going to appear on the screen, you know, like the first label, eh, I, you know, yeah, we probably should give it a meaningful name, but... I'm less concerned about that. Why? Because we're just displaying on the screen. We're not really do anything, doing anything with it. However, that last one, we're doing something with. We're going to show it, and we're going to hide it. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to change the ID for this to label spoiler. If I can type. So this window here, when you click on an element, when you click on a component, on a control, you can go in this window down here and set values of the property. Now there's a whole bunch of property properties that we can associate for, for anything. And here's the interesting thing, is there's a bunch of different ways that we can style this. We can put style stuff in the ASP.NET control. So we can, for example, set the foreground color, set the, the background color, and so on. We can also set the CSS class for this, which is potentially useful. My suggestion is to continue to use CSS stuff to handle the formatting and the displaying of the page, as opposed to using the ASP.NET controls. They make that available to you, but for the most part, I think you're better off from a maintainability perspective of using, um, using um, CSS. Remember, you could always assign a class to something here and apply CSS that way, and you can always do CSS based on the ID of the element. All right? Okay, go ahead. If you do anything in there, does it like create a CSS file with stuff in there? It, it doesn't create a CSS file. It like uses, uh, what would you say, inline or embedded, inline, I think, CSS. Okay. So that's notoriously difficult to, to change. So for example, let's say I was a pharmaceutical company and I had warnings, you know, I mean, you ever listen to those warnings on the TV about the medication? It's like, sometimes like the side effects sound worse than the, me than the, than the disease. It's like, no thanks, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with my migraine headaches. I don't want all these other things happening to me, you know? But um, let's say I wanted to style my warnings a certain way, all right, and, and the side effects. Were I to use ASP.NET um, attributes, to style the warning labels on these pages, I'd need to go and set all of them if I decided to visually represent labels a different way. All right. If I did it via CSS, then I could just go to one place. I could create a class called warnings, assign every label that class, and then just have a separate, uh, or have contained in the CSS file a style rule for warnings. Then I could instantly make all my warnings look the same. Let's run this. Let's, let's first of all, let's look at the ASP.NET code, and then let's run this.
this and view it after the server has processed it. So here's the source. Let me turn off my volume. shell of an HTML file, just like we had before. There are some declaratives up here that give some information about it. For example, it explains where the code behind is, and so on. The controls we created are represented in ASP.NET controls. Could I do this with plain HTML? Yes, I could. I could. I, I didn't have to make a label. I could make, for example, a span. All right, an HTML span, and put my text in there. And I could, instead of doing an ASP button, I could do an input type equals button, and so on and so forth. However, where possible, generally speaking, it's better to use the ASP.NET controls, because that gives you a little more flexibility in your coding. Not to say that I couldn't make this with plain old HTML and then add server-side coding to access those HTML elements. I can do that. Uh, but I would only advise doing that if you like inherited, inherited a legacy project. If you already had some HTML and you wanted to sort of retrofit it to do ASP.NET. Um, then, yeah, you might go in and, and, and keep them as HTML and just add attributes uh, to it to make it um, work on the server. If you're doing it from scratch, though, you're better using the .asp.net controls. So we have a label, a button, and a label. What are these going to translate into HTML? Well, span, an input type equals submit, and a, another span. So let's run this test this and see what we get. Well, that's the HTML we get, which remember, we haven't done anything with the visibility of this guy yet, so we see it. If I do a view source, it's pretty much exactly as I described. Span with an ID of label 1. Input type equals submit with a ID of button 1. And a span with a ID of label spoiler. I could then go and write style for these different things if I wanted to. All right. Now... That's not where we want to end this, though, right? We want to initially hide the spoiler and then make the spoiler appear when we press the button. So how can I initially hide the spoiler? Well, if I look over here, if I go into that control, among the list of properties is whether it's visible or not. All right? So I can initially set this to not visible. All right. So now when I run this, what do you think we're going to get? Just the first. Pardon me? Just the first two. Just the first two elements, right. And here's something that's interesting. Let's do a view source. We don't even get that third element. It's not like it's put out there and made invisible. ASP.NET, the server and ASP.NET knows if it's not visible, don't send it to the client. So that object exists on the server side, but it doesn't get translated because we said it's invisible. It would be a waste to, to send it. All right? And that's nice just in case you get some wise guy trying to look at your HTML source and 
Well, again, they would serve them right and see in the spoiler if they were looking at your HTML code. But anyhow, um, in other examples, uh, you know. Um, one of the things that, that you, um, um, uh, your second lab assignment, if I'm not mistaken, involves taking the page that you did for week one and making it so that you can only show one of the categories at a time, all right, by clicking on different stuff, all right. Well, if you think about it, and, uh, that by, by following the, the, the logic that if it's not visible, the server doesn't send it, that means each time it sends a page, it sends a smaller page in your case. Instead of sending three blocks of code, it's going to send only one block of code. So there's reasons for doing that. Okay. The button is a submit button. It's hard to tell, but if you look at the status, Every time I click it, it's again requesting a page from the server, all right? But it's not doing anything, all right? There's no code. We haven't written the code behind yet to do anything when that button gets clicked. So it's going to the server, and it's thinking it needs to do something, but there's no code written, so it doesn't do anything. All right, that's what we want to do next. All right, so... If I double click on the button, um, let's go into design mode. If I double click on the button here. It takes me, it does two things, all right? One thing it does is it takes me into the code behind, and this is where we're going to put the code, all right? This is where we're going to put the code to show it, all right? The other thing it did, which is less obvious, is if we look at the source here, Yeah, I wish you had a higher resolution screen so I could show more stuff. It added to the button an on-click event. All right? That's what ties the clicking of the button to that C-sharp code that we're about to write. All right? Every now and then, you know, if settings are wrong or if you change the name of something or if you create a function get rid of it and then create another function or whatever every now and then the control and your code aren't wired together so you click on the button and nothing happens if that is the case what you do is look and make sure that there is an on click attribute that says button one underscore click or whatever the name of the method is whatever the name of the method is in your C-sharp file. Button one click. Even though it says on click, don't confuse this with the HTML on click, which invokes JavaScript. This is going to submit and is going to call on the server. All right, it's going to call on the server. When this gets called and the button is clicked, it's going to call that piece of code. Again, this is one of the reasons that I spend a lot of time talking about the client and server interaction because it's important to know when this runs. This does not run on the client side as soon as I click it. Clicking this button sends a request to the server. The server knows the button got clicked and then it goes and does the processing and sends the results back. All right? So be careful about that. If your code doesn't run, be sure it's getting be sure be sure the server is getting called. All right, because um, if the server's not if it's not being submitted to the server, this isn't JavaScript and this code won't run. All right, what's this code going to look like here? Well, we want to manipulate the attributes of that label. How do you suppose we're going to do that? Well, we start with the ID of the label. We have to say what it is we want to manipulate. Because, spoiler. pardon me? The label spoiler. Label spoiler, right? Because I don't want to hide the 
first uh, sentence. I don't want to hide the button. I don't want to change the color of the page. I don't want to do any of those things. I want to point to that one thing. So we use IDs to point to the thing on the page that we want to deal with. So in this case, label. And again, IntelliSense even tells you that. All right. What is it that we want to change about that? Remember, the label is an object. The label has a whole bunch of properties, right? It has a text property, it has color properties, it has border properties, it has a whole bunch of properties. What is it that we want to change about that thing? Well, what we want to change is, and scroll down, the visible. What do we want to change it to? I put my mouse over that for a second. It might be a little hard to read. But it tells me that this needs to be a Boolean. All right? So in other words, it's not like, um, you know, negative one means visible, one means invisible, or something like that, some goofy thing like that. It's a Boolean. So we initially set that property true to be visible to make, uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. We initially set the uh, Boolean to be uh, false. We now want to set it to true. And we end with a semicolon. All right. So now when I run this, All right, not there, it's not in the source. When I click it, watch what happens. It's going to submit it, it's going to go to the server, it's going to execute that line of the code, and the web page that the client gets in response to submitting this is going to be a page that includes the spoiler as well. And there we go. Questions about this so far? All right. One, one thing I try to emphasize in this class, and in fact in all programming classes, is taking a systematic approach to debugging. All right. In other words, what is the least effective way of debugging is staring at the code until the answer jumps out of the screen and smacks you on the head. All right? That's the least effective way. But you know what? That's the way that a lot of people do. And I'm not even really talking about just students here. All right? Students, you figure, well, you know, hey, they haven't learned the process yet. That's okay. But I've seen professional programmers, like, just, like, take a systematic approach. And what do I mean by a systematic approach? I mean, you know, work at it like a detective, you know. Work on possibilities. Eliminate possibilities. Use the tools that you have. You know, Sherlock Holmes had the magnifying glass to look at. He used that tool to, to look for clues or whatever, all right. And he went through a process of eliminating different things until he finally got to the answer. Well, you've got to perform that sort of functionality. Now, one of the tools that you have at your disposal is the debugger, all right? The debugger allows you to see what code is getting executed on the server, all right? I'm going to go and I'm going to mess this up, all right? I'm going to mess up the code here, all right? So it's not going to work, and then we're going to try to figure out how to make it work. I'm going to turn this off. And again, it's going to be kind of a goofy mistake, but it'll be a mistake nonetheless.
bugs me sometimes when I have trouble breaking the code. You know, break. You know, making a mistake in my code. It's like, am I that good of a programmer that I can't even make a mistake on purpose? But usually that's not the case. All right. So I broke this code. And I'm going to run it and show you that it's broken. Projectors don't like to be turned off and on quickly, so the projector is mad at me. Okay, here it goes. All right, I'm going to run this. So far, so good. I clicked the spoiler. Nothing. All right. Now, the inclination for a programmer is to sit and stare at the code and try to figure out what's wrong with it. That looks right to me. Any time now, jump out and tell me what's wrong. We could stare at this for a long time, all right? What's the systematic way of approaching this? The systematic way of approaching it is first saying, does this instruction ever get run? All right? Does this instruction ever get run? So how do I tell that? And we'll, we'll go over more detailed examples of this as the semester progresses, but I want to introduce right from the start the process of debugging. I can click right here on the margin, right there on the margin, and notice that it put like a little red, almost like a stop sign there. That's what's called a breakpoint. All right? What a breakpoint is, is when that line of code, when I run this in debug mode, when this line of code gets hit, the server is going to stop and it's going to show me that it's running that line of code, and I can look at all the different variables and see, gee, something doesn't match my expectations. What is going on here? All right, so I'm going to run this. I click Show Spoiler, and nothing happens. So what could be wrong? You're not hiding the spoiler in the first place. No, I'm hiding the spoiler. Not there. And yeah, I heard a couple answers over there that were correct. I went and deleted the on-click event from here. So in other words, that code is correct. That's why staring at it is ineffective. All right. Even correct code doesn't work if it doesn't get called, <laughs> all right? And that's why you can stare at that code. And again, that's a one-liner, right? So the answer to this is sort of obvious, all right, especially if you've gone through a few examples of this. But when you get to longer code, you will swear that, well, there must be something wrong with that. And if it's not getting called, then, well, that's what's wrong with it. So let me go and undo. Put that back in. I originally tried to change that from a 1 to an L. That would have been a better answer, a better way to do it. But it gave me a compile error. It wouldn't let me compile it because there's no such event. So curses foiled again. All right. Now I run this. And I click that. Now notice what happens. The debugger goes and it shows me it is on that line. And I can highlight these things and I can look at the different values and I can make sure that it works the way that I want to. I can then go and either step through a line at a time or, well, you know, 
do what I need to do. I can step into, over, or out. So I can either like go past that instruction, go see what other functions are called, whatever. I'm going to step out, and there we are, back to showing the spoiler. So it's a consistent thing. Um, I will almost always ask you if you have code that doesn't work. I will almost always ask you if you've run it through debugger. All right. Not because I'm being difficult or argumentative, but because it's a good practice to get into. All right. Okay. Well, how could we make it to, to hide the spoiler again? Well, we could do this a couple ways. We could add a second button there that does just the opposite. We'll try that first. The other thing we could do is we could make a sort of a toggle button. Click it once, it shows it. Click it a second time, it hides it. Shows it, hides it, shows it, hides it. All right? So let's do this in two steps. All right? I think sometimes it's good to sort of build up to it, not just leap there all at once. All right. So let's go in to the UI and add another button. Change the text of it to say hide button. Hide spoiler, rather. Double click it to get into the button click to event. And I'll do just the opposite to make it invisible again. Show spoiler, hide spoiler. Is it a problem if I click show spoiler when it's already shown? No. It, just, it shows it again, which really doesn't do anything. It sends it back through the server, so there's a little bit of server traffic. All right. from here. The wheels are turning. All right. One thing, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take two approaches to this. All right. Looking at how much time we have left. We'll take two approaches to this. First approach I'm going to take is, well, I don't need to hide the spoiler unless the spoiler is being shown. And I don't need to show the spoiler unless the spoiler is hidden. So maybe I don't show those buttons unless they're relevant. All right. So initially, I'm going to load the page. It's going to have the label, and it's going to have the show spoiler button, but it should not have the hide spoiler button, and it should not have the spoiler. How could we accomplish that? And then the reverse is true. When the spoiler is being shown, it shouldn't have the show spoiler button. It should have the hide spoiler button and show the spoiler. How could we change this to work that? Does everyone get what I mean? In other words, when the page loads initially, when the page loads initially, Page loads initially, it's going to hide that button. So I'm going to have two buttons, but I'm only going to show one of them at a time. So it will show that. When I click the spoiler, it will show the spoiler 
and this button will be hidden. We can do things with an if statement, but we really don't have to in this case. We can do things with an if statement if we have one button. If we have one button, we, we're going to use an if statement to tell if the, show, if the spoiler is being hidden or shown. But if we have two buttons, we don't really need an if statement. What do we need to do? What's this page going to look like initially? Just one button. Just one button. So the show spoiler button is fine the way it is. All right. What do we need to do with the hide spoiler button? Make it invisible. Right. Make it not <coughs> visible. So, how do we make things invisible? Well, there's two ways that we can do it, right? We can set the property of it, and that sets the initial state of it. So, in other words, when this page loads, I want this button to be invisible. So, I'm going to go in here and make that button invisible when the page initially loads. Now remember, we can write code, all right, we can write code to change these properties as well. So what do I need to do in the code behind here? Well, when I click button one, after I show the spoiler, I want to Hide button one, and show button two. So after I show the spoiler, I want to hide the show spoiler button and show the hide spoiler button. I hope you got that, because I don't think I could say that again. <laughs> and the reverse is true. When I click the hide spoiler button, I want to show the show spoiler button and hide the hide spoiler button. So now when I run this, all right, initially, because I set in the properties, that button doesn't show. The hide spoiler button doesn't show, but the show, show spoiler button does show. When I click on this, it's going to do three things now instead of two, or I'm sorry, instead of one. It's going to show the spoiler, it's going to hide this button, and show this button that isn't there. And there we go. I click that or back to that. Oops. Questions about this? Let's do this another way. All right. Let's do this with only one button. How can we do it with only one button? All right, let's make a second page. So I'll go up here and say new file web form default to and I'm going to paste this I'm going to get rid of that second button. Alright, so that's what I want the UI to look like. What's this code need to look like? What you do in the if statement? Here's where you do the if statement. I look to see if the spoiler is visible. Alright? If the, there's two cases, right? The spoiler is visible, the spoiler isn't visible. If the spoiler is invisible, then what do I want to do? I want to show it. And if the spoiler is not visible, I want to hide it. 
Oh no, I said that wrong. If the spoiler is not visible, I want to show it. If the spoiler is visible, I want to hide it. So, I can write an if statement. An if statement does a condition, right? It looks to see if a certain condition is true or false. So I can say if label spoiler dot visible equals equals true It's a Boolean, right? So if it's not true, it's false. There's no third possibility. So if it's visible, what do I want to do? Hide it. Hide it. So what would the instruction be? <coughs> do I want to hide the button? Label. I want to hide the label. Label. Spoiler. Dot visible equals false. Alright. Let's see if this works. Sure looks reasonable. not visible. So when I click the button, what should happen? It should notice that it's not visible. So that first part of the if statement isn't going to be true, therefore the else is going to be true and it's going to be made visible. There we go. Click it again, the opposite's true, and it goes away. Now, what's wrong with this picture? The button still says show spoiler. So what do we do? We change the text. Exactly. Keep in mind that any of these properties that are defined for an element, all this stuff that you can define for the properties of the element, you can set in the property builder, all right, you can set through the IDE, through Visual Studio, to give them the initial value. But, you can then go and code to change it. So I could change the text of the, the button to say, um, uh, hide spoiler or show spoiler. So let's look at the code behind for that. What do I want to do here? Button one dot dot text equals this actually would be show spoiler. I had to think about that for a second too. It's like a double negative here or something. And then this one would be hide spoiler. All right. Show a spoiler, hide spoiler. A couple things to notice that how did it know to run this? Well, because that's the page I was editing. All right. If there's ever a page that you want to run, like let's say this page required me to first go through the home page, you can right mouse on a page and say set as start page. That way it will always call that page as a start page. Like some of our later examples that we're going to get into with database interactivity, there'll be like a query that, or there'll be like a home page that takes you to a query that takes you to the detail of a selected item. Well, you can't jump right to the detail. You have to go through those other pages first. So then you can set that as, as a home page. Just a note, I said if that equals equals true, 
Uh, I think you've all had C-sharp, is that correct? All right. The double equal is used for comparison. See, this is what I do. And my brother does this all the time, right? Asks you if you already know something, and then if you say yeah, he repeats it anyhow, all right? The double equal is used for comparison. Yes? Um, if you do that set as homepage, do you have to unset that then when you're done, or does it automatically? No, it actually doesn't remember it from, from time to time. So the okay. next time you do it, you'd have to set it again. Okay. So here I am comparing the value of the visibility property to true. Here I am assigning the value of the visibility property to false. So a single equal is assignment, a double equal is a comparison. Now, can I, this is legal, and in fact a lot of times I will code this, this way. All right. Does everyone know why that is legal? Or is that confusing? Exactly. Because label spoiler dot visible is already a Boolean. All right. So this is the equivalent of saying if it equals true. Because what does an if statement do? Let's say I had an if statement that said if x is greater than 1. <laughs> I heard laughing, and it was like, uh-oh. All right. <coughs> Let's add an if statement that looked like that. What does the server do? It evaluates this expression to determine if it is true or false. So it has to do a numerical comparison, is x greater than 1? In this case, since this is already a Boolean, it doesn't need to evaluate it. It already knows if it's true or false. If it's visible, it's true. If it's not visible, it's false. So one thing I do a lot in coding is to do that simply because I think that looks cleaner. I think it looks cleaner, looks easier to read. You do it whatever way you want to. All right? We could all, we could actually get by this without writing an if statement, I think, except for that pesky label. All right? Because I think we can do this. Let me comment this out temporarily. No, nothing at all. Just a I think this will work. Pardon me? I just said whatever value it is, make it the opposite of it. The exclamation point means not. And again, you can do that with Booleans. So if it's currently true, make it not true. If it's currently not true, make it true. So this would work in one line, all right? And that'd be really cool, and you could impress your friends and, and probably win on Jeopardy if there was ever a C-sharp category or things like that. However, we still need an if statement to handle the labels. You do the if statement, just do it all day. So yeah, so. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the uh, exclamation point represents not, because we can use that in other contexts as well. We, we can see if something is not equal to something or whatever. Um, I will say um, that within reason, clear code is better than clever code. Okay. This might be a little confusing for people. I don't know. I hesitate to say that because you can do a lot of cool stuff with clever code. My suggestion would be to comment it if you do something that you think people might not really get what you're doing. All right? But do remember that the clarity of the code is uh, of paramount importance. The, you know, we code things a certain way because that makes it easier to change. 
all right? And um, therefore, you know, this isn't uh, what year, you know, 1965, where processing speed was critical and anything you could do to shave a little bit off of the execution time made a big deal, you know? Um, so again, make sure your code is, code is clear. Any questions about this? Now the thing is, again, from this example, all right, the thing that I hope that you get from this example is, number one, how to wire, for example, a button to a piece of C-sharp code, remembering that the C-sharp code executes on the server, that the pages, the request is submitted, the server looks at it and then executes the code in preparing the next response back to the client. And the other thing that I would hope that you get from this is the fact that any of the properties of these controls are fair game. All right? We could make something where you clicked, you know, you clicked something and it changed the color of the page or whatever. All right? So keep that in mind that any of the properties of this is fair game. They're dynamic. We can set the properties. We can configure them in the IDE through the properties um, window. But we can also write code to access and manipulate them. Questions about this? All right. We'll see you in lab.